153. Ownership and Authority. Helseden Position Paper Number 128, December 1990. Definitions are important. Without accurate definitions of words, concepts, and doctrines, communication is weakened, meaning is endangered, and society is seriously affected. A serious educational problem of our time is the lack of teaching on the use of a dictionary. When I was a schoolboy, dictionaries were not an unusual gift at Christmas or on birthdays. Now I suspect they would not be welcomed. One of our current problems is the decline of precision in recent dictionaries. From the first Webster's Dictionary, 1828, to the most recent one, the decay is very evident. This does not mean that Noah Webster was always as accurate as he should have been. The word authority in recent dictionaries is declared to be the the right to command and to enforce obedience. This does not tell us what the source of this right is. The religious issue is not dealt with at all. Noah Webster's definition is essentially the same. The important question is not raised. In every time of crisis, however, it is this question which is foremost. In the late medieval peasants' revolt, the challenge to all human authorities was this. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? In other words, who made kings and bishops man's overlords? By what right did anyone rule over others? The peasants were killed, but they were not answered. From a biblical perspective, the problem has a very blunt solution. Authority derives from ownership, and God, as the creator and owner of heaven and earth, and all things therein, is the absolute Lord over all. We are told repeatedly, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Exodus chapter 9 verse 29, chapter 24 verse 1, Compare Job chapter 41 verse 11, Psalm 50 verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 26 and verse 28, etc. Because of his ownership, God commands men and gives them his law. Again and again the law is declared with a prefix, I am the Lord, that is, the sovereign and owner. Because authority derives from ownership, God is the absolute authority in every sphere and therefore the only valid lawgiver. In the modern world, however, we see a culmination of a long process separating ownership from God and giving it to the state. Socialism is the logical outcome of this process. The modern world is made up of states which are in varying degrees anti-Christian. One expression of this is their progressive seizure and or control over all kinds of property. The goal of socialism is the state ownership of all things. This means replacing God with the state and making the state the source of all law. For scripture, man is a steward under God. He is commanded to exercise dominion and to subdue or develop the earth in terms of God's law and mandate. As a steward, man is given responsibility and he is accountable to the triune God. As a steward, man has a delegated authority and he is responsible to God for his use of the things God has given him. That authority is destroyed by socialism. The ownership and authority over all things is transferred to the state. The state stewards are its bureaucracies. As a result, the people at large are encouraged in irresponsibility. Too often, in fact, they want to be irresponsible and choose socialism. Where men do not have nor wish to have godly delegated authority under God, they seek after lawless authority and domination. In The Institutes of Biblical Law, Volume 1, pages 427 following, 
I dealt with a text, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19, and chapter 20, verse 18, with respect to sexual relations during menstruation. I was startled to find how many men and women objected to that text and to any use of it. God's law here establishes boundaries on a man's use of a woman and a woman's use of herself. The man does not own her, nor does she own herself. They are alike God's property and subject to his law. Not even in the most personal relationships can anyone feel that his thoughts, body, time, mind, possessions, or anything else are his own. He is God's property and under God's authority. The issue of ownership and authority confronts us on all sides. About two years ago, an Illinois periodical established a related publication in New York. The New York editor began to dictate policy, or attempted to do so, to the parent publication and to his governing board. He was rightfully fired, whereupon he made all kinds of invidious charges and played the role of a victim. He failed to recognise that neither publication was his property or that his editorial status did not make him a universal censor. He had no awareness of the meaning of either ownership or of authority. Somehow he felt that his office gave him immunity from governments and control. Teenagers will argue that they have a right to use the family car and any restriction on their freedom is a tyrannical imposition. Since the meaning of ownership is taught by neither church nor school, we should not be surprised. To the degree that human authorities are not grounded on God and his law word, to that degree they are coercive. God's law is the least coercive of all. It gives us a little more than 600 laws, a very large percentage of which men cannot enforce because God reserves that power to himself. Man's law, as it departs from God, becomes more and more pervasive and increasingly coercive and oppressive. Man's law combines the destruction of responsibility in man and replaces it with a growing power, coercion. Less responsibility with more coercion. The late medieval era saw the decline of God's law and the increase in the state's law. The nation-states and city-states began to supplant God's law with their own. As David Nicholas has shown with respect to Ghent in the 14th century, there was no notion whatsoever that homicide is immoral. The city had no statutes forbidding it. David Nicholas, the Fanart de Feldes of Ghent, Ithaca, New York, Cornell University Press, 1988, page 6. In fact, premeditated homicide was a contract legally enforceable in the courts. Page 117. Hired, quote, hit men, end quote, could go to court if not paid. With the decline of Christian faith, God's law remained valid for the rural and backward areas only. God's ownership and authority meant little to these men. As we see abortion and homosexuality prevail legally, we can recognise the same disintegrating forces at work that were then only stopped by the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. If we deny the absolute ownership of all things by God, we destroy valid authority in society. With the Enlightenment, and certainly in the 19th and 20th centuries, it became commonplace for quote-unquote thinkers to contrast reason to authority. Reason, supposedly, had a natural inevitability, and, with education, all men would in due time become rational. This would end this way of authority, and reason would naturally prevail on all sides. Problems would be readily solved, and the universal prevalence of reason would help eliminate authorities. One scholar questioned all this to a limited degree. Hal Hofting, 1843 to 1931, a Danish philosopher, 
so authority as inseparable from personality and subordinate to it. Without agreeing with Hufting's philosophy, we can say that both reason and authority are aspects of the life of persons. Whatever more they are, they still are manifestations of a person and his life. Supremely, we must say, both reason and authority are most revealed in the Godhead. To separate reason and authority from God and from his image-bearer, man, is to harm both. As Christian theological authority is separated from the person of God, and as reason is made an abstract thing, both authority and reason begin to evaporate. The authority of a secular, humanistic state is unreal, and it decays rapidly, to be replaced by brutal coercion. Reason becomes the object of cynicism, steadily replaced by the aggressive will of man. Where the person of God is not the absolute source of authority and reason, both soon disintegrate, and so too does ownership. The continental Hegelians, as well as the British and American, saw the state as the evolving spirit of being, and hence of the reason and nature. They thus depersonalize reason, and also their new centre of rational authority, the modern state. The triumph of modern statism has seen also the triumph of amoralism on the part of the peoples, as well as the civil governments of our time. Without a faith in the God of Scripture, the living God, ownership and authority decline. This decline will continue until the crown rights of our King are recognized, for Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15.